So let's go and bring this into Notepad so that we can see it. We would do that if we always knew, if we, if we were hard coding this search to look for just people whose last name started with H-U. All right? But again, we don't want to do that. We want the select statement to accept a parameter so that every time we run this, we will supply the parameter for this that indicates which people we want. Now, the way that you indicate a parameter is with a question mark. In other words, I don't know what it is, I'll fill it in at runtime. So the actual select statement we're going to do looks like this. Where FL, FL name like question mark, and then I'm adding on to the question mark the wild card. I'm just adding it on to the end of it because I want it to start with the parameter. So whatever I've typed in as a parameter, I want to start with it. If, again, I was looking for it anywhere in the string, I would do wildcard plus question mark plus wildcard. And that would find in my parameter that I typed in the text box um, anywhere. All right. So. We create our SQL statement, and the difference between this and the earlier SQL statements that we've done um, tied to ASP.NET is that there's a parameter involved, all right? Because we don't know what that value is, you know? The rest of that SQL statement can be hard-coded, and this is going to be sort of a continuing theme. When we think of our SQL statements, whether we be uh, doing a select, an insert, an update, or delete, there's a part of the, of the SQL statement that's going to be constant. If we want to delete an employee, delete from employee where employee ID equals, and then there's going to be a parameter that we'll fill in. Right? So think of these parameters of bl as blanks that are going to get filled into our SQL statement because we want, to, we want a different value for them every time we run this. Uh, question? Yeah, couldn't you just use a string variable there? What do you mean use a string variable? Declare a string value variable from the text box and then pop it into the statement. Well, what we're going to do, well, what, uh, um, eventually we're going to do pretty much what you suggested. But we have to follow this procedure. When we define our SQL statement, we have to simply use a question mark to indicate, hey, there's a parameter that's going to get filled in. In a minute, after we've defined the SQL statement, we get to tell it where that parameter comes from. So to answer your question, um, we'll do what you've suggested, but we have to do it in this manner. All right? So I'm going to take the SQL statement and pop it back into this. All right. Now watch. When I click next, we get a new screen. All right. And that screen is asking me, where does this parameter come from? All right. So yeah, so we're going to fill it in. Where does that parameter come from? It comes from one of the controls on our form. Which control on our form? It comes from the text box. All right. So now we're telling the SQL statement where it's going to fill in that parameter. 
We've defined that SQL statement with a blank for the part of the name that we're looking for. All right. Now we're saying, hey, by the way, here's where you fill in that blank. Now, there could be two parameters. Someone had mentioned, what if we want to do a search for first and last name? Well, we could write a query like that that had two parameters and two where clauses, where first name like this and last name like this. And there'd be two blanks that would fill in and would point to the two text boxes, the one for the first name, one for the last name. All right, I click Next. I'm going to test my query by clicking that. It's going to ask me for the value of the parameter. All right, and let's say I'll type in C. And there's a problem with the query, gasp. Here's what I do when I encounter that. I go and copy and paste it into Excel. So let me go in, because Excel is going to give me a more descriptive error message. Uh, Excel, access. I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Where you got to go in there? I had this new trick. Yeah. Well, I'll paste it in there, then I'll wait a minute, then I'll copy and paste it into Access. How about that? Go. Yeah. So let's go into here. And let's go and run our query. So I'll go to Create, Query Design. I'll click Close. Go into SQL View. And again, I can't use a, the question mark here. So I'll have to hard code a value in. So I'll hard code a value of C, because that's the one I got the error on. The other thing I have to change, unfortunately, is because now I'm in the world of access, I have to use an asterisk. And I run that, and, ah, Frank Desk Frank. It should be Frank dot Frank Desk. All right. Whenever you run a query in Access and you get one of these little boxes up, it's telling you it doesn't know what that column name is. So it doesn't know what frankdesk.frank is. In reality, the table name is Frank and the column name is Frank Desk. So um, I, I just need to, to flip them around. Actually, not even flip them around. I want where faculty Frank equals frank.frank. .frank. So... That's a good debugging um, technique to do, though, by the way, is um, because you're going through an extra layer within your ASP.NET applications, you won't necessarily get as good of an error message as you will by pasting it into to access. At least that's what I found. So this should be frank.frank. .frank. All right, next, next, test. All right, no one's last name starts with a C. Is that really true? That is really true. I thought there was someone in there. See? Learn something every day. Let's put a B in there. All right, there we go. All right. One thing you notice, I put in a lowercase b. Um, SQL queries of uh, where clauses and that are, are case insensitive. So therefore, you don't need to worry about that. Um, unless you configure the database to be case sensitive. Some databases, you have that option. But again, typically, uh, by default, it's not case sensitive. So, okay, we're in business. Can you show your new SQL statement again real quick? Yeah, let me go. I'll, I'll go and paste it in a notepad. I just got that table name on there. I put in Frank Desk, and it should be Frank. This is sort of a goofy uh, table where the table and column name are the same. That's why it says Frank Frank. 
<laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Um, typically, what I do in that case is I, I always call the, the column the key something like the table name ID or table name code or something like that. Like, so if I were doing this, it would be Frank ID is the column name and Frank is a table. All right. So where is, um, where is it recognizing you're pointing to the text box in your, in your Visual Studio files in VB? Um, in the when, when, when it configures the data source is where it will link the parameter to the text box. So when I go here, I specify where I'm finding that data. I'm saying the text box. We'll go and we'll look at the source of this in a second, and you'll see that it's within the controls. It, it's telling it, hey, by the way, this select statement has one parameter, and you know what? Get that parameter from that text box. Okay, so we're good to go, and we can finish. The last thing we need to do is bind these two together. All right. I'm not going to edit the, t the, the grid view right now. We'll maybe go and do it in a minute. All right. But then when I run this, I type in B and do a search, it shows me my two people. Alright, if I type in a C and do a search, it shows no one. If you put nothing in. If I put nothing in, it doesn't show anything. Alright, now, let's go and look at the, the, the source for this to, to fully answer your question. Which is a good idea to do any time, anyhow, because I don't think last time we looked at the source for that. Yes? Um, is there a way to display everybody? Or that, that automatically is a limiter of what it will display? If we're using the default behavior, there's no way to automatically select everyone. We, we would have to write some code to do mm -hmm. that. All right, let's go in and look at this. All right, here's our form. Here's our text box control. Here's our button. Here's our grid view. All right. Our grid view is associated with that data source. <coughs> here's the columns on the grid view. Now here's our data source. All right. Here's a connection string. And it's telling it what this line says is get the connection string from my web config file. That's what this interprets to be. Likewise, it's getting the provider name from the web config file too. We'll, again, we'll look at the web config file in a minute. We'll see those two parameters in here. Now, oops. one of the attributes of the SQL data source is a select command. So you'll notice there's the actual select statement. Select FID, FF name, FL name, Frank desk, from faculty, F Frank, where faculty equals that, and faculty name like, question mark plus quote percent quote. Now, here's where the parameters come in. So, again, the parameter, the question mark matches with the position of the parameter. Alright, so in other words, in this case there's only one, but if there were two question marks, the first question mark would match up with the first Thing under select parameter, the second would match up with the second thing under select parameter. All right. Now, this is a control parameter, which means that um, the value from this is coming from a control, the text box. There's other places the value could come from, and we'll explore those shortly. All right. But it's saying that that parameter is coming from a control. Which control? The text box, and finally, which property? 
the text property. So it's taking, this is what tells it to take the text property from that text box and pop it into that first question mark. All right. So it is really in the construction of that control. Remember, um, when we go through that GUI and we go through the, the wizard and all that, all it's doing is it's writing the code for us. We don't have to go through that GUI if we don't want to. All right? But it's a really good idea to, to do so because the .NET framework is so rich and there's so much in it that it would be very difficult for us to remember all that. Yes? Does, does Dreamweaver do all that stuff too? Does Dreamweaver do that for .NET? I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. Uh, my, my belief would be, just like someone had asked a question, I don't remember who, but someone asked a question about running .NET on a Linux platform. Oh, that, was, that, that wasn't any of you folks. I know who it was now. And the answer is, you know what? Some of those things you, could, you might be able to do, but it's probably not a good idea even if you can, right? Because, you know, this is a Windows product. It's built to run on Windows, and therefore anything that you do to try to shoehorn it to behave a different way probably isn't a good idea. You're probably going to get bit by doing that. So, um... Using Dreamweaver for this, um, at best I would use, if I, if I was absolutely in love with Dreamweaver, I would use it to create maybe the visual design of a page and then bring it into here and ASP.netify it. All right. At any rate, this is a parameter that hooks to the parameter in the select statement. It's important to know this view, and let me tell you why. Every once in a while, I've seen this, where Visual Studio gives you the wrong number of parameters. I don't know why, probably because humans wrote Visual Studio just like every other piece of software on Earth. And you'll have the wrong parameters in, say, an insert or an update or select. So it's good to be able to see. That, that's almost impossible to tell from the GUI, right? Because the GUI sort of hides the details from you, all right? Which is fine, because most of the time we don't care about the details. We do care about the details when things don't work, right, though. And we want to go and dig down and see exactly what's going on in the code. All right? But anyhow, that's, what, that's the code and the controls that get generated based on our activity in the GUI. Now let's look at the web config file as promised. And we'll see that we have our connection string in here that has a provider and a connection string. And that connection string was correctly created because we see the pipe data directory pipe. That's saying this application's data directory. As opposed to seeing a hard-coded path there. If you see C colon backslash anything, then it's not done correctly and you should change it to data directory like this. Yes? And, uh, I was wondering if you wanted to access a database out on the internet, you could put an HTTP below um, the path to it there. Pull your data from a uh, different server. If you wanted to pull your data from a different server, what you do is Remember, the connection string that you create is going to be specific to the database platform. If you're pulling the data from a different server, then chances are it's not an access database, right? In which case, you need to provide some other parameters, all right, to connect to a SQL Server database. Uh, so, yeah, your connection string for a SQL Server database will include the, the path to the server, and permissions, you know, the passwords and all that to get into it. So yeah, there'll be additional information for, for connecting in that scenario. Yeah, it, whatever you need to connect to the database. Yep. So in the, the previous part of this is the, the connection string? I mean, if you page back a little bit. That? Yeah, okay. Yeah, the connection string really consists of two parts, the connection string itself and the provider name. All right, so we accomplished part of our job. See the benefit of trying to do 
only one thing at a time as opposed to trying to do everything all at once. We can, we can now, we can go home with the satisfied feeling that at least we got part of it done. Of course, we're not going to. We're going to try part two as well, but theoretically. All right. Let's, let's at least improve the appearance of this. I've gotten to, uh, I've gotten corrupted over the years. I mean, I came out of a background where, you know, there was no such thing as GUIs and punch cards and all that. Now I'm hypersensitive about the appearance of, of pages. So I'm going to go in and edit this. Um, and I'm going to remove the FID because I really don't need to see it. I just need it in the data source. Um, and that will become apparent in a minute why we need that. Uh, I'll go and change the headers on these. And I'll go and apply one of their cutesy little auto formats. Only Microsoft would consider this layout colorful. <laughs> it's black and white except there's this sort of color. This does the barring across alternating rows. We'll talk more about that later on, but that's effective if you have a long row. You know, your eye tends to go up and down as you scan across something. The, the more that you scan across, the more apt your, your eye is to get confused and go up and down, especially if you're dealing with a, a long list of items. You know, that's why a newspaper column is only so big as opposed to across the whole sheet. Well, these bars sort of help you um, keep your eye straight. All right, so questions on this part. Let's at least talk about the next part and uh, see if we can get it in or not. <clears throat> All right, so mission accomplished on page one. Let's now move to page two. We'll at least start this. And I'll tell you what. We'll leave this and this out for now. You know, maybe we'll add it uh, on Tuesday. Let's just display all the information about faculty on this page. In other words, their first name, last name, office, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, what do we need to know to pull up one particular faculty member? Right? FID. We need to know the FID, right? To pull up a specific member of an entity, we always need the primary key. Right? To pull up a student, we need to know the student ID. To pull up a faculty person, we need to pull up the faculty ID. Therefore, this page needs to have the faculty ID that we selected. All right? How is this page going to get the faculty ID that we selected? Well, where is it going to get it from? Well, it's going to get it from the database. Mm -hmm. I mean, or, oh, it's going to get it from the selected name via, or, Grant? Wouldn't it get it from the grid view if you put in the name and get Okay. Switched? All right. Good. All right. In other words, remember we said in our foreshadowing that we better have the FID in here. Why do we have to have the FID in here? We need the FID in that grid so that when they select, let's have maybe a button that says 
details here, or a link that says details here. <coughs> when we click that link, let's say there's two faculty people. There'll be a details link here. When they click that link, we're going to pass to this page somehow the FID. All right? So this link is going to be constructed in such a way to include the FID of the person that we select. All right? How can we include a piece of data on a URL? How is that done? Kind of take the FID to the end of it. Exactly. Does anyone know what that's called when you have a piece of data tacked on to the end of a URL? It's called a query string. All right? So, in other words, these two links on this page, we had two different professors who started, last name started with B. These two links on the page are going to link, or on the grid rather, are going to link to the same page. What's going to be different about the URL is going to be the value of the FID that gets passed. So, in other words, let's say this page is called details. Alright? And let's say this person's faculty ID is 10, even though we're not displaying it. And this person's faculty ID number is 15, even though we're not displaying it. The link for this person needs to be details.aspx id equals 10. The link for the second person needs to be details.aspx id equals 15. Now, don't be disturbed by the fact that it's actually FID in the database and I'm calling it ID on the query string. It doesn't matter. All right? As long as we know what we're calling it on the query string, we can pull it off the query string and stuff it in the faculty ID. Okay? So, our URLs need to be different for each of these two pages. All right? And, again, this will be a real common theme that you'll see going forward. Part of that URL is constant, right? Which part of the URL is constant? Details.aspx question mark ID equals is constant. Every single faculty person, that will be the first part of their link. All right? What is different from person to person to person? The value of the ID tapped on to the end of the link. So that's what's going to be different. So it's almost like our SQL statement over here, right? Whereas most of the SQL statement was static, select, blah, 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 is always the same no matter who you're searching for. There's a little blank that gets filled in at runtime, all right? And that's the same idea here. So first job is to construct a link on this page that is a dynamic link that contains the ID of the person that we're interested in. That's job one. Job two, then, is using it on that details page. Now, what do you suppose the SQL statement is going to look like on the details page? We want to pull up one person and one person only. Right? We want to pull up the person whose ID we got passed on the query string. So, Select star from faculty. What else do we need to have on that? Where FID equals FID. Well, not where FID oh, equals FID. FID. Where FID equals the thing that we're getting from the query string. In that case, it's a parameter. All right? So just like this was a parameter, this is going to be a parameter. We're getting it from a different place, right? In the first example, we got the parameter from the control, from the text box. Here we're going to get the parameter from the query string. But it's still a blank that needs to be filled in, all right? It's still a piece of that SQL 